It's really great to see such a good crowd. I'm, I'm quite happy because uh, we've been, not only do we have a, a big stellar lineup of presenting companies today, what we don't have is a whole bunch of protesters outside just even oil and gas conferences. No, none of them either in Vancouver. <laughs> Forget that. No. So uh, we, we, we came to much friendlier climate here uh, for the conference today. And what we found was that as we've done these conferences in Toronto and Vancouver over the years, we had the same group of people come out, and that's fantastic, and I see a lot of those familiar faces here today. But I thought, just coming to Calgary, this is where the real companies, the tier one companies are, and uh, sometimes getting them to come out to Vancouver or Toronto was not always the easiest, but we scheduled this so that uh, Q1 reporting was done, year-end reporting was done, so nobody had any excuses in terms of, well, I can't talk right before our financials get released. So. Everything that these companies have is in the public domain. We're going to get uh, the most up-to-date presentations. And so the way the day is going to work today is I've asked the management teams to keep their presentations to only 20 minutes uh, and even 15 minutes. And then really it's all about Q&A. And of course, during the breaks, they're going to be here to uh, answer any questions you have in person and certainly at the lunch. Uh, so that's what we're hoping you'll be able to do is engage them directly, talk to them, ask them any questions. Uh, please don't be shy. So because there are, these presentations are only going to be about 15 minutes and then we're going to have 15 minutes of dead space. You're all going to have to look at each other if you don't have any questions. So uh, today our, uh, and I'll, I'll just as another notice, uh, Nathan Weiss is here today. Uh, he's here all day. He's sitting in on most of the presentations. He's here at the break, so uh, of course, as you're well aware, he's made us a lot of money over the years, and he's got a lot of great knowledge about the oil markets. So please take advantage of that today and uh, strike up a conversation with Nathan. You all got his presentation uh, before, and I think you all know what he looks like, but I'm going to ask Nathan to stand up at the back there. Don't hesitate to uh, go over and say hi. Uh, as I say, the, the management teams themselves, uh, they will be here uh, during the break that is closest to their presentation, so please take advantage of that and talk to them. That's one of the reasons we try and do the conference this way, is schedule these breaks so you get to go talk to them. And, and retail really has a, they don't come out to many retail conferences, so it, it, it's wonderful that they took the time to come out today. And of course, the other big part of today is just being here with each other. You're all fairly dedicated energy investors. You know, find out who your neighbor is and where they're from and what kind of things they've been looking at. And you might learn a few things about investing from the person right beside you as well. So uh, our first guest today is Ken Pensky from Parex. As you know, Parex has been a big pick of mine for a long, long time. And uh, Ken is gonna be able to go through the whole story here very quickly. And then as I said, if you have any questions, uh, Please get them ready and we'll have a mic and you can just uh, speak out loud one, once the presentation's over. So Ken, you want to come up to the podium? Oh, and do we have a, oh, there's, there's your clicker. Thanks so much for coming. Thank you very much. Okay, God bless. Thanks, Keith. Uh, Thanks for having uh, oil go up today too, just for the presentation. It's always nice when commodity prices are going up when you're in front of people because then people are a bit happier. Um, this is Parex. We started Parex in 2009. We had $100 million in the bank, um, four blocks in Columbia, two blocks in Trinidad. Uh, you know, now it's 2018. We have over $200 million. Let me see if I can get this working. We have over $200 million of working capital. You can see there we have no debt. We have 43,000 barrels a day production. That will be our target for this year. We'll get there. And um, we have interest in about 20 blocks in Columbia. So it's been a great story. Um, part of it is Columbia is a great fiscal regime. Um, it, we get pipeline access. Big story here that, you know, people having problems getting their product to market. We've never had that problem in Columbia. When we first got there, people were concerned about it. And then, um, you know, people just couldn't find as much oil as they thought they would. And production now in the country has declined from 40% from levels when we got there. So we have ample space to get our pipeline, our, our oil to port, and we get Brent minus $4 pricing. So today at Brent $75 a barrel, we're probably achieving a $71 to $70 barrel at that export. On top of that, we have royalties, taxes, operating costs, and things. But the government burden overall is about 22% if you look at royalties and, and taxes on top of that. So it's a pretty decent fiscal regime. 
And it's like Canada. If you make more money, you pay more taxes. It's a royalty tax regime. It's pretty simple that way. But you can see that the growth over the last three years, we've gone from 30,000 barrels a day to our target today is 43,000 barrels a day. That's at the higher end of our range as we announced at our AGM about a month ago. We'll spend $290 million to $300 million of CapEx. And all this is in U.S. dollars because that's how we report. Our, our price, though, of course, is Canadian dollars. At a $70 oil price and 43,000 barrels a day, we'll make about 455 million U.S. of cash flow. We'll spend, say, 300, we'll have 155 million of free cash flow. At a $75 oil price, we'll make over 500 million U.S., which means we'll have 200 million of free cash flow. We will not be ramping up the capital program to match that cash flow in 2018. And so we'll have free cash flow to deal with. And what we're doing with right now is we're buying back some stock. But that's about $60 million out of that number. So, you know, we have ample room with the balance sheet plus the free cash flow to, to look at the BD and to get our programs for the next five years in shape. Uh, that's been our, our, our sort of our, our compounded adjusted growth, 17% in production per share, debt adjusted. That's a figure that you'll see lots of people talking about. Uh, 2P reserves, we've increased by 43%. Basically, when you get to Columbia, people, the knock on Columbia is you, you, you can't get a decent reserve life index in Columbia. It's great oil, it's great productivity, but you can't get a decent reserve life index because they're smaller fields with, with high quality rock. And we've kind of busted that myth because at the end of the day, Columbia was a place that was underexplored. Um, because of the issues they had in the past, you couldn't conduct a broad 3D sur survey on your lands. You had to go in with very specific 2D surveys and smaller 3D surveys. And if you drilled a well and didn't find anything left, what we've managed to do is drill a few more wells and find that things get bigger as you drill some wells. And so we've taken smaller pools and made them bigger. But part of that is, is because Columbia just was never worked over like Western Canada was in the 80s and 90s when 3D seismic came into being. You can see our funds flow per share matches oil prices. And then on the bottom right-hand side, we give you an idea of how we performed against the index, the index in yellow, us in green. And we're pretty much always over outperforming the index. And part of that is, is the cash flow generation in Columbia and our success, which is driven off that 17% production per share debt adjusted chart there. Um, we have no debt, positive working capital, been through that. Uh, one of the things that people always want us to talk about is our, our Brent pricing, um, as opposed to say ACO pricing or, or WTI, Western Canada Select pricing here in Canada. And, and, and that's important because, you know, as the first thing Keith asked me this morning is, what do you think you're getting today with oil prices? Well, over 70 bucks a barrel. And that's, you know, U.S. dollars. Um, our growth was, you know, has been double digit for the past three or four years. Even in 2016, which was the worst of the, of the I guess, the commodity price cycle and the worst of uh, people's feelings of where oil prices would go, um, you know, we were thinking $30, $40 barrel, we're getting the business ready to run at that, which it could. You know, we still grew at about 10% on a production per share basis. And our capex was less than our cash flow even then. So it shows the ability of the, the, the asset being very strong. Also, it shows that the fiscal regime was very, was very good. As prices came down, you paid less. We got to the point where we weren't even paying any tax. So it's, it's very much like Canada in that respect. If you look at our guidance, that was based off $55 a barrel, which, you know, six months ago wasn't a bad shot. Um, of course, what everybody else talks about is their maintenance capital, their growth capital. Our chart's backwards compared to most people you see. Our maintenance capital is about 25 to 30% of our capital, and our growth capital is 65 to 75%. And most companies, it's the opposite. And the reason why that is is because our base declines off our assets right now is about 10 to 15%. And that is because we have a large conventional field that is in the early stages of development. And, you know, the unconventional players will have higher declines because that's the unconventional. You have very good production up front, and then over five to six months, you get down to about half of, half of that. Conventional, large pools, um, early stage life, you have very little decline. So our development capital for the next couple of years is going to be very small compared to what our growth capital can be. Drilling program, we'll drill about 45 to 50 wells gross this year. That's up about 10% from what we would have budgeted. And you can see we've got development, or 30 to 22 of them, which includes development in our tight oil plays where we don't even have reserves booked yet, so that's more like appraisal. And then we have exploration and appraisal wells as well. And it all ends up to being 45 to 50. We currently have about six rigs working in Columbia, two non-operated and four operated. 
So, um, you know, if you ask me how big is the business in Columbia, there's probably 75 rigs working in Columbia right now. So we're almost 10% of the amount of equipment in the, in the country. Cash net back, we give you some granularity of how our net back is calculated. That is a cash net back, that's after all taxes, G&A, um, what, what have you. And then against various um, Brent pricing scenarios on the right hand side, we give you what our cash net back would be. So we're pretty easy to figure out. If you think that oil will be $70 a barrel next this year, that's a $29 cash net back times our 15.7 million barrels are produced this year, and that gives you your $455 million of cash flow. And we've been showing this chart for, for years. We're largely institutionally owned, and if we didn't have confidence in it, of course, you know, we'd be called out on it. So um, we're pretty high degree of certainty that will be what we'll be getting here this year with our production forecast. Marketing costs, and just an idea of how we get our crew to market. Um, most of our crews produce in what they call the Llanos Basin. Llanos is to the east of Bogota. It has to go through two mountain ranges, and then you get to the coast. Mm -hmm. And so those transportation costs are around $11 a barrel. Um, but it's pipeline access or barge access. So either way, there's ample, again, as I was talking, there's ample uh, takeaway capacity in the country. And then you can see our marketing costs have trended downwards from 2016 to 2018. And that's because the country used to produce 1.2 million barrels a day, and now it's down to 850,000 barrels a day. You produce less, that frees up space on, on pipelines, and then you can get a better deal. Um, being a good country in that respect, um, again, we're not trucking oil to the coast or anything silly like that. We truck infield basin, gets on a pipeline or gets on a barge, and it gets to the coast. That's our production per share on a quarterly basis, and of course the, the yellow line is production per share on a debt adjusted basis. And it's been a, just a steady run since 2000, March 13. We could send this all the way back and it would still be a nice steady run with some more lumps as you're smaller, you grow lumpier. And you know, that's again a lot of traction we get with people is we're pretty consistent. Um, we've made guidance 21 quarters, 23 quarters, sorry, now in a row. And the reason why we make guidance is because we don't produce full out. We always have some production be in our behind pump. So all our wells are on electronic submersible pumps. We dial down the frequency. Um, when we need to, we dial it up when we need to. And it's safe to do that. I mean, any operator should actually operate their business that way because you never can tell when you'll have shut-ins and things. And what the market hates is missing production guidance because you forgot that something was going to happen. You're going to have workovers or anything. So we don't miss production guidance. If we have a workover, it gets covered up because we're always understating what we can, what we can produce. Um, this is our reserves growth on a 3P, 2P, 1P basis, as well as reserve life index growth. And really what, well, this thing doesn't want to work there for me. Really what we're trying to show is that our 3P reserves on the left-hand side tend to get converted into 2P reserves over time and then 1P reserves. And you can see our production's rising at the same time that our reserve life index is extending out and lengthening. And that's a function of, um, we are a conservative reserve bookings. GLJ does our reserves. And you probably all know of them or heard of them. And on top of that, we have a, a large, couple of large fields that we're still appraising and developing, and these fields are getting bigger. There's our 2P FDNA, um, three year and over the last three years, it's sub four dollars over the last, you know, three years, and our three, and our three years come down from ten dollars a barrel to about four dollars a barrel. And that's why we're paying taxes because we're successful. I mean, really, when you look at it. A four-dollar barrel, two PF and D for a conventional oil pool. That's fantastic. This is the, the heart of the business right now. This is um, about a 26-kilometer trend. It's got 150 million barrels of two P reserves booked for us. It's producing. It says in our chart 55,000 barrels a day. And on the next slide, we're up to about 60,000 barrels a day on it now. And when we got there in 2012, there was no oil being produced from it. There was one well drilled, drilled into it. And so this is the type of opportunity you still have in Columbia. And this was sitting in between two large oil fields, nice fault trend, and people hadn't drilled it because land wasn't available. It became available in the land bid round in 2008. Some small companies got it. They couldn't really work it very aggressively. We took over one of them in 2012, and um, you know, when, once the seismic was shot, and we started drilling. And now we've drilled about 100 wells, I think, on the, on the block. But we're still exploring for it. The stars are exploration wells. And then you have development wells within, within the block itself. And we have 55% of the middle block. The block to the right top is 85% us. 
and we're 100 percent in the block down below. Right now we're building a pipeline on that block that will take a capacity of 75,000 barrels a day because we're running about 500 trucks a day on that block moving oil around and that's getting to be a bit too much. So we'll build a pipeline and then we'll also um, over time we'll, we'll see what, what good plateau production there is for that. It's, it's right now focused to be about 75,000 barrels a day um, but it, it was 65,000 barrels a day we thought last year. We keep finding more oil there. And it's not multi-zone, but there's two good zones that we produce from at any given time. That's the south end of it, and we're appraising that right now. Um, for our institutional shareholders, they're asking us questions where the stars are because that wasn't oil last year, and they're also asking us about the white area on the map. And uh, effectively, we're drilling in some areas that um, still have not had any reserves booked to them. So half the wells on this trend will be development wells this year, and the other half will be what they consider appraisal wells. This is to the north end of the trend. Last year, we started drilling again off a well that consumed 3 million barrels um, with no water, and the structure maps that we had said that should have watered out about a year ago, so we started drilling around it, and we're just trying to find the edges to that trap off to the north. And it's connected with the other pool to the south, and so it forms one long trend. And there's also another zone to the north as well that we're exploring and finding. Um, so each one of those wells that you see to, to the right-hand side and up has got dual zone capacity to it. And I guess what we like to tell people is that at one point, you know, we had walked away from that piece of the property, and now we're walking back to it. And this is what happens. It's a, you know, you, you, you drill things, you let them produce and see how the wells, how the wells produce and how they decline, and when they don't decline, you know you have more oil there than you think. So you go back with the drill bit. Capachos is our only um, big exploration in, in an area that I guess would be considered a hot zone in Colombia. So in Colombia, as you know, there, there were various security issues going on. There were a couple of guerrilla groups that were active. And to the north of the country on the Venezuelan border is a block called Capachos that we farmed in with our state company called Equipatrol. And we've drilled uh, two wells there. We're testing the second well. And it comes off a play that was producing in the in 1990s, and then Repsol and Equipatrol Patrol left the, the play due to surface interruption, i.e. security threats, as well as they couldn't get their well cost below $40 million. These are 16,000 foot wells. So we're drilling them for about 15 to $20 million and producing oil from them. And on top of that, the security threats have reduced because there was a peace treaty in Colombia with one of the main groups um, this year. And on top of that, the last group is starting to, is at the table with the government right now, talking about some sort of peace treaty with them. So it's gotten to be safer. I wouldn't walk around in this area myself. My security people will get all upset. But it's the only place where we actually have, um, you know, an, an army presence around the, the camp. We don't have it on the camp. We don't have security guards or guns or anything stupid like that. But we have an army presence within two kilometers of that, which they've always been. Uh, moving over, if you go to the left of Bogota, there's what they call the Middle Magdalena Basin. That was the first basin that was active in Bogota. They were producing oil there in 2015, 2020, or sorry, 1915 and 1920. So it's a very established area. We were farming in uh, primarily with Equipatrol, the state company who owns 70% of the land there. And we're trying to do a couple things. One, there's, it's heavier crude, um, so we're trying to use chops, which is you know, cold, heavy oil production. The other thing we're doing there is we're also doing some tight oil. So they have fields that we think could be like the cardium here in Canada, but they haven't really produced them except on vertical. We're not talking a horizontal multi-frack, but we're talking some stimulations to clean up the wells a bit. Um, technically, in Colombia, it's tough to drill with oil-based mud. You drill with a water-based mud, but the shells like to soak up the water, and so that causes problems. So you create a skin on the well bore. So what we're doing is trying to clean that skin up and increase the productivity. So you take a well that would, say, produce a 50 barrels a day and try to get it to produce 150 barrels a day. Nothing different than we didn't do here in the 80s and, and, and early 90s, but they just haven't had a chance to get around to doing that in Colombia yet. And this is part of the same trend that we did early on, where we took 3D seismic where they never really had a chance to shoot in Colombia and used it to find new pools. We're now taking old technology in Western Canada and applying it in Colombia where they just haven't needed to do it or that this training doesn't allow them to do it. So in this area, here's a little field we, we got into with, with Echo Patrol. Um, we've drilled some wells, put them on water flood. We're trying to get it up to about 1,000 to 2,000 barrels a day within 12 months, and then expand it to the south and drill some, some new patterns and see how long far it extends. 
Um, but it's the type of opportunity we, we can get and we can source with the state company. These wells were drilled, they drilled five wells in the 60s, produced them until they either ran out, pumps dropped, or one well was doing 20 barrels a day still when we got there. And they never decided to go back to it. So we said, hey, let us come in, we'll spend some money on it, we'll earn 50% and um, we'll see what we get, basically. Because, you know, usually when, you, when there's oil there, that's half the problem, now it's getting out of the ground is the other half. And we're pretty good at both. So these types of opportunities exist within Columbia. Um, part of the problem is you have to work with the state company, which is a different beast, because state companies tend to work at their own pace. Um, here's uh, an idea of some of our big E. The field, or the block to the left, we got in 2014, just before the crash. We saw our seismic in 16, um, early 17. We're keying off three fields that are gas, oil fields around it. We think um, that trend extends up. Chevron drilled a couple of wells in, in 1991 and 1992 off a 2D seismic, and we think they missed it by not much, but they missed it. So we shot 3D over it, about a 300-kilometer survey, and we think we have um, a great opportunity that we're drilling right now. And um, if it's in the northwest part of Columbia, so if it's gas oil, then we'll have a home for gas because the Caribbean basin in Columbia needs gas. Um, and if it's oil, that's fine. It's quite close to the coast and we'll get it out the normal way. But it's again, it's an idea of just taking older technology and applying, applying it on areas that just, that just you couldn't work. Up until about six years ago, that block was a problem with minefields. It's being demined with safe to work. The communities want us to be there because they have 30% unemployment and we bring oil field jobs. So it's not like some of the places here in Canada. And, and that again, that's just the story with Columbia. You know, as, as their peace treaty and their peace negotiations um, expand, their acreage expands, and it's a very resource-rich country. So that's the summary. I hope I kept myself under time, and uh, happy to take questions. You know, it's, um, their peso was trading with the price of oil, Pat, and it's interesting, when oil was $100 a barrel, their peso was like $17.50 to the U.S. dollar. When oil was $40 a barrel, it went down to about $3,300 a U.S. barrel. It's now at $28.50. Their inflation's running about 4%. So when we were working in Argentina, we used to see a 20% inflation and a 20% depreciation of the peso. But what always covers you off when you're an international oil producer is you get paid in U.S. dollars. So you know, when the price of oil dropped, I was still getting paid in U.S. dollars. But our costs, a large degree of our costs were in pesos, so the peso was dropping. So it wasn't dollar for dollar covering the drop in the price of oil, but it was a good shock absorber. And much stronger than it was here in Canada when the price of oil dropped and Canadian dollar dropped. You know, the peso dropped much more. So what we're seeing there now is the peso just hasn't run up. Um, they're in the middle of elections right now, so that's caused their, their currency to, to stand. And the government policy was to keep FX low as they could so they could be more competitive as an emerging market against the U.S. dollar. So, you know, our, our margins have stayed very strong. And we don't hedge the pace so much at all, really. It's, it's, you can, it's liquid, but I just find that uh, I can't guess on FX. I hope that answers. Hi. No. No, it's natural water. Uh, yeah, it is, but nature provided it. It's an edge water drive, and the water's way out to the edge, and that's why we're still trying to find out where the edge is, and we still haven't done that. But we effectively are producing, you know, 1,000 to 1,500 barrel a day wells. Um, they go on pump. The completion is a perf. There's no, there's no fracking. There's nothing like that. We perf them. We put a pump in, spin it up, and let, the, let nature throw it at us. We will start in time and, and, you know, we'll have some injectors at various pieces of the field, some corners where we think the water is so far away, we just better get some injection in there. And we're seeing that now. We're seeing some depletion in a few of the wells. So we'll look at converting some wells to injectors and drilling new producers. But the majority, you know, we, we believe the majority of that field will never be, have to have any sort of uh, man-made water flow to it. Well, with our balance sheet, yeah. Um, Columbia right now, you know, the, the majority of the land is held by Ec Patrol, and they're not doing anything with the election right now happening in May and June. So it's, it's pretty quiet in that respect. 
there's some private companies um, that have assets. A lot of the assets they have, they would have got through older contracts with Equipatrol, Patrol, so they're not the best contract. You know, uh, one of these things where you pay 100 to earn 20. So we don't do those. Um, and some of the other things that we've looked at are companies have come and shot the 3D, drilled a few wells, not had success. So we're working with some of those companies to get them out and pick up their blocks because we think they've missed something. And um, so there's a few of those, but it's pretty slow right now. It's normally we do two or three at least farm ins every year. We don't really buy production, but we farm in on blocks where people have bent their pick, as we used to say, and want to get off the position and we think they missed something. But we haven't even done one of those for over 12 months, which is slow. So we hope to get a couple done this year. So the Mirador? You mean in uh, that big block? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, the Mirador is one of the main producing zones in the Llanos. We're producing out of four or five zones, including Mirador, yeah. Yeah. Well, Casano yeah, so the stuff you're talking about is Cusiana, and that's right up on the main pipeline. So we truck our oil to Cusiana, and it's about 50, 60 kilometers away. As the crow flies, probably 100 kilometers by road. But yeah, it's in that area. No, no, that, that's more like foothills drilling, so that's much deeper. So our key, our average drilling depth is like 11,000 feet, and we'll zip the wells down in about eight or nine days um, because it's under pressure really most of the way down, and there's no zone of interest until you get to, you know, kind of 11,000 feet, 10,500 feet. Just out of curiosity, why Because the government has restrictions on it. Now, you can if you go ahead and spend a ton of money building your own and licensing your own facility. <laughs> yeah, well, no, it's, it's one of those things you go, why do we keep having problems with these shales when everybody else doesn't have problems with the shales? Well, we've got to use a water-based mud. So, um, you know, we'll get around it. There's, they have some quirky legislation there. Um, permitting, you know, for development drilling is easy. It, what takes time is exploration drilling. We go through a, a process that's environmental, fine, archaeological, fine you know, get your well permitted. And then once you drill the first well, if you have success, you can follow up fairly quickly. It's within a week you get permits, which I understand is quicker than it is here now in Alberta. But the first well on a block, like an exploration well, is tough. You know, you've got to take your time. And that's where in the past people would think I can do it in four months, and then they'd tell the market, well, I couldn't get my permits. Well, no, it was always going to take you 12 months. You just didn't tell the market that. So don't blame the government for it taking its time. Now, it hasn't gotten any quicker, and that's one of the things that, you know, the government's going to have to address. But, you know, we're still drilling exploration wells on brand new blocks like that one I showed you. You know, so it's, you just have to take your time, and you have to have a bunch of people down there that know what they're doing, you know, really. Sir? Well, they had their initial runoff, and the pro-business got 39, felt like got 39 percent, and the uh, more left-wing, he's actually an ex-guerrilla, whose last name is Petro, which is oil in Spanish, <laughs> um, he got 25 percent. Um, they'll go into a second run, is what they do, because no one got 50 percent, and we expect that uh, the pro-business candidate will win, because typically what happens when you're that far ahead, there's not enough the other candidate can do. And they'll coalition up. So those, there's voters that voted for the other pro-business person that will now throw their cards in with, with the fellow that survived. So we expect there'll be a, a, a pro-business uh, president. There's a pro-business Congress right now, which has already had. Those elections have happened. And we expect they'll go back to focusing more on the, the fiscal balance of the country and, and, and the economy. They were focusing the last three years. Uh, the, 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 the predecessor president, President Santos, was all about the peace treaty. That was his thing. He got his Nobel Prize out of it. That's what he wanted to do, um, and that's what he focused on. And so, really, um, they have let the economy kind of slide for the last couple of years. So we expect they'll start focusing on the economy again, because one of the things that peace treaties with guerrilla groups bring out is incremental cost for the government. They've got to pay for this somehow. You're effectively bringing people onto the government payroll until they can settle themselves in, because an unem unemployed ex-guerrilla fighter is a kidnapper. You know, that's just a bad thing, right? So. They're, there's, they're cost, it's going to cost them some, and they're going to have to pay for it, and now they'll get back to the dealing with the economy to pay for it. And really getting up that, you know, their direct foreign investment has dropped horribly the last 10 years. To give you an idea, Air Canada used to have a business class flight to Bogota. They don't have it anymore. And you can tell by the airports. The airport they built used to be full. It's half full now. So 
it's something you have to fix. Sir? Not, not in Colombia. In Latin America, sure. Um, Colombia's been pretty good. They, they haven't really had the military dictatorships that other countries have had. They've had issues with, with security and they've had issues with governments. They, they tend to have what they call the rule of law, and the rule of law is, 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 uh, is very sacred to them because they've never had access to foreign capital in, in a big way. So they couldn't play games like Argentina always can. And I know I used to work in Argentina with our predecessor company. And, you know, we have Argentines working for us still in Bogota. And there's all sorts of great stories from Argentina. But Colombia never had that ability just to do what they want to do and beg for forgiveness later because they never had the stability in their, their, fisc in their, in their economy effectively. And that's a smaller economy than Argentina. Um, every one of our contracts is with the government as a separate contract. So if they want to change royalty rates, they'd have to change the royalty rates and renegotiate them in all the contracts. And so they don't change the royalty rates because... They can't, effectively, because if they did that, they'd also be changing the royalty rates in their own state company, which has public ownership in, on the New York Exchange. So they haven't. They've told that to people. During when oil was $135 a barrel, the then president came up and said, we're not changing the royalty rates. We don't. You know, rule of law here is very important. What they can do is like what Canada can do or any other country, they can change tax rates. And they've done that. They brought tax rates up and they brought tax rates down and they play with that. But it's like Canada, you know, the more you spend, the less tax you'll have because the more taxable income you can shelter with your capital expenditures. So, you know, I, right now we're about 22% total government take. Prices go up, that'll increase because the royalties will become higher. Um, and, you know, your taxes will become higher given that our spending will stay where it's at. But it's all very easy, it's all transparent. I can forecast it very easily. We've had... The state, um, we've had tax auditors in the office. They do just like what Canada does. They come in, ask questions, and leave. It's, it's not like some friends I had used to work in Russia, where tax auditors are coming with guys carrying guns behind them. So it's, I, I find it a very friendly uh, regime. And, and there's one thing I just found out on Sunday. They had applied to become a member of the OECD, and they were accepted. So they're one of 37 countries in the OECD group of nations, which means something. You know, especially for them, but you know, it means something for us because we've always said it's a it's a good fiscal regime, and we feel safe there working there. So. Yeah, I mean, local content there is really important. So local content isn't local Colombian content; it's local town content. And there's a formula when you're working within municipalities: how many people you hire from each municipality. So we're constantly, when we go and drill an exploration well, we've got to train a new rig crew, basically. <coughs> that means the first well is not going to be very efficient. But as we sit there and warm that crew up, um, yeah, they get efficient. And that's why our costs will be, our development costs are going to be 40 to 30% of our exploration costs on a per well basis. And there's good equipment there. We don't need, you know, we're not doing horizontal two, two miles, you know, multi-horizontal wells. Um, but, you know, we, we see that there's companies down there but in, um, walking, walking triples so we can skid them over and we drill cellars, skid it over, drill another cellar, skid it over. Mm -hmm. We do big directional drilling, so there's directional equipment there that's in good shape, and that's Weatherford and, and Halliburton. Cementing's good. There's not a lot of fracking in the country because you don't need to do it, so there are some crews, but when we're doing a stimulation, we maybe pump 10 tons of sand. I mean, the peop that's not even a stage here anymore in Canada. You know, it's, it's crazy. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, for what we need, it's fine, yeah. And, and facilities and everything are very simple. You just separate some water from the oil, clean the water, put it back down into the ground. Oil goes into a tank and gets trucked to the pipeline. So it's pretty simple stuff. No, no, it's sold to anybody who bids on it when it gets to the coast. So I sell to BP, Shell, traders like Trafagur, Glencore. I used to do cargoes to PetroChina. You know, they take it. So all, the crude from Columbia, because of the Panama Canal so close, um, it's Atlantic Basin, but it can go anywhere. It goes to Europe, it goes to the Pacific, it goes to the Gulf. And right now, because the Venezuela crude is, is rolled off, production's rolled off so much, that, that Vasconia crude blend that we produce, it's called Vasconia, um, it's very highly sought after in the Gulf, because that was the feedstock for the refineries that Venezuela used to provide. Well, we didn't expect to be there for 10, and we're almost there now. You, you know, we're, we're shareholders, 
I'm, I'm not, we're not here to build a legacy. Our first CEO is retired, he's now our chairman. Um, so we've had succession plans built in for the company. Uh, we'll get to 50,000 barrels a day next year. You know, it's a, it's a great place for a company looking for oil. So does a larger company take us out sometime? Yeah, potentially. You know, because you can't get Tidewater access. I think they've learned that when you buy oil, you can't buy it in a place you can't get access to it physically. So I keep thinking one of these days someone's going to say, I want re oil for the home refinery, and that's a great place to get it. But, you know, we'll see what happens. We're not, we're not rushed. Yeah, we do that every year, a three to five year kind of business plan to make sure that we're thinking ahead. Yeah. So, but, you know, with the cash on the balance sheet, what I was, the point was we're not looking at investing that cash right away now. We have a motto in the office. It's hanging up there. It says, don't do anything stupid. And, and what companies can do when they get too much cash, exploration companies with geologists, they tend to want to drill stuff, even the stuff that they wouldn't have drilled before because it looks better when you have cash on the balance sheet. So we're very conservative that way. So what we'll do is, you know, we'll continue on with our CapEx plan. Um, we'll pick up a few more blocks and, and, and expose ourselves to some more inventory, of course. But, you know, for now, we're, you're going to see cash puddling on the balance sheet for a period of time. And then that's why this year we'll buy back some more stock than we probably would have thought we'd buy back. Again, we're out of time. Okay. Thank, Thank you very much, Keith. Now, now, just um, a, a couple of things. So Ken is going to be here at lunch uh, from 1 till 2. And so if you didn't get a chance to ask questions down at the Rimrock, you'll be able to do that. Uh, some questions for Ken today that we didn't get asked is like um, this pipeline that's about to get built. How much is it going to cost them? When's it going to get built? How much would, should that, that should improve their net back. If, when you're doing 500 trucks a day and now putting in a pipe, that should be a big increase in cash flow once that pipeline's operational. When's that going to happen? And things like, um, you know, that whole idea of pipelines constraining production a little bit. You know, here in the North America, we see these basin differentials blow out badly. WCS hit 30 buck differential this year. The Bakken hit a 30 buck differential in 2012. The Permian's going to hit a $30 differential next year. Maybe we asked Ken at lunch, you know, what kind of diffs, how volatile are their diffs over time? So those are questions you can ask Ken uh, at the lunch.